One of the key figures in the early days of regulating new drugs in the United Kingdom was Professor Bill Inman. Sadly, he had bad polio when he was a medical student, and he now has to spend all his time in a wheelchair. And so I went down to see him at his home outside Southampton and talk about the beginnings of the Committee on the Safety of Drugs. So can you tell us how it all started? Well, I suppose, Stephen, the, uh, the first uh, indication of trouble was 1956 when uh, Dr. Mukta of Rheinchemi Grunenthal um, invented thalidomide. And it was marketed in this country the following year as Distaval and mm. in Germany as Contagen. And uh, two or three years passed, really, before uh, it's alleged that uh, Bill McBride in Australia spotted an yeah. association between thalidomide and congenital abnormalities. And uh, uh, Widdekun Lentz in the same year uh, said he'd seen 52 babies in, in Germany with, the, with these limb problems. Uh, and following on that, I, I was at that time working with ICI in their medical department, and almost out of the blue, uh, I, had, I had discussed this uh, at meetings of Amarpia, which you mm. may remember was the Association of Medical Advisors in the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. and so it, it was known that I was interested in setting up some sort of a scheme to monitor new drugs. And out of the blue, a letter came from uh, Sir Derek Dunlop in, in uh, the end of '63, inviting me to, to show an interest in the, in the new committee, committee yeah. he was forming. The committee had been set up by then? It ha had established, as far as adverse reactions were concerned, the total number of yellow cards was in the contents of one shoebox, literally, Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I joined. And I would, in fact, have been in right at the beginning had I not uh, been late starting. I was ill. Yes. Yeah. So what was your background? Uh, how did Dunlop choose you? Well, uh, it's rather obscure because the letter from him came completely out of the blue. But I had been, uh, at, the t at the time when I was working in ICI in their medical departments, and I had been showing an interest at, at various meetings in uh, the possibility of setting up some sort of a monitoring system. You were working for ICI? How long have you been there for? Uh, I'd been there for about five years, I mm -hmm. suppose, by that time. Yes. And this was because of your polio or because um, you were interested that in...? That was my choice of career was really dictated by the fact that I had polio as a medical student. Yes. And uh, uh, it seemed that it was skin psychiatry or something, laboratory work, which didn't appeal to me. And you did, of course, have quite an ICI background. Uh, it had been in the family for since yeah. uh, the early 20s. Yes. My father was a founder yes. member of the company. Yes, yeah. So you, you get uh, to uh, the committee in 1964, and uh, what, what's happening? Eventually arrived in, yes, in, in 1964, uh, by which time yellow cards were just beginning to trickle in. And yes. uh, there were various uh, bits of publicity to encourage that. Derek Dunlop himself wrote a letter to all doctors, yep. circulated yep. it with yellow cards. Mm -hmm. And they started to come in, uh, I can't remember the exact rates, but I mean a thousand a month easily and maybe more than that. Yeah. Who was the chairman of the committee? Uh, the chairman of the main committee was Derek Dunlop himself. Yeah. And he operated three subcommittees. Uh, the first was a uh, subcommittee on toxicity, which was uh, the chairman of that was uh, Professor Fraser. Uh, the second was the uh, clinical trials committee, uh, Robert Hunter, mm -hmm. Bob Hunter. Yeah. And the third was Adverse Reactions, Leslie Witts. Yes. This was really the subcommittee that the attention was focused on? Um, I think it was, um, it certainly could be the most dramatic when, when things went wrong, yeah. uh, as with the pill and yes. the asthma deaths and so on. Yes, yes. We, we got most of the press attention. Yeah. Leslie Witts was the distinguished professor at Oxford. He, he was a specialist in blood dyscrasias, and I yes. think uh, that was felt to be one of the target uh, areas we might get involved in. Yes. And was he an easy person to get on with? And to work uh, I, li I liked him very much indeed. Yeah. He was yeah. very quiet, very considerate, uh, a perfect gent, in fact. Yeah. I, I was very fond of him. Yes. And who else was working there on the... Uh, the names well? I can recall, uh, it's now over 30 years, um, Ecky Kernsberg. Who was a GP in Edinburgh. A GP in Edinburgh. Yeah. Owen Wade, who at that time was in Belfast. Um, Bill Mushin from Cardiff. Who was, was a, a professor an of anaesthetist, yes. Um, Michael Lynette, who I believe was, was the Queen's general practitioner. Yep, yes. Uh, who else um, on adverse reactions? I think that was about the... Uh, Roy Goulding put in an occasional appearance yep. from the yep. Poison Information Centre. Yeah. 
Yes. How exactly did you work? Well, the keystone of the whole operation was the yellow card, which was a, a very simple business reply card, folded double and glued round the edge for security and confidentiality. And these were issued periodically to doctors with a, uh, who were encouraged to report any suspected reaction to a new drug uh, and any serious reaction to any, any drug, however uh, old or new it was. Uh, and it was an entirely a voluntary system. They didn't get paid for it. Uh, and on the whole, I think they, they responded very well. But of course, uh, the yellow cards really grossly underestimated the probable numbers of events which were occurring. Can you give us some examples of uh, what well, actually I can, I can certainly actually remember the first drug that uh, uh, hit, hit us, uh, struck us as dangerous was a drug called uh, benzoiodrone. It was a drug used in heart disease and it quite obviously caused jaundice. And the company was persuaded to remove that voluntarily without any, any pressure. All that was kept under wraps. There wasn't much publicity. Well, that's right. I mean, we didn't seek publicity. The, uh, uh, another good example was ditransin, which was the precursor of brufen, which yep. is now still on the market. That did the same thing, two waves of jaundice, one when they issued it to hospitals, and the second one when they issued it to general practitioners. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Boots had no difficulty taking that one off the market yeah. straight away. Yes. So, firstly, the drug was taken off the market. Did you also issue sort of warnings to uh, Several times. I can't remember the... We had a, a thing called the um, Adverse Reaction Series, which the company is called the Yellow Peril. Yeah. And the first one we issued was monoamine oxidase inhibitors. We put out one on chloramphenicol, mm -hmm. which wiped out aplastic anemia virtually, except for the odd patients who'd used the stuff in France or Spain while in the Costa Brava and got a, f a cold and yeah. came back to die of aplastic anemia yes. in England. Yes, yeah. And then <laughs> there was a particularly high spot or low spot with the pill. Uh, yes, the pill first impacted about 1965. Uh, and... Um, there have been odd anecdotes in various journals. I think the first man ever to produce one was a man called Jordan, who described three cases somewhere down in the West Country. These were cases of what, pulmonary embolism? Of, of or uh, pulmonary embolism, yeah. I, yes. uh, I think they were pulmonary embolism. Yeah. Uh, and by about the beginning of 1966, uh, it was obvious that um, if we'd had 100% of reporting, the, the estimated incidence was about what you'd expect from the, national, the Registrar General's figures. Yep. And clearly, you couldn't have um, believed that you were getting 100% reporting. And so we had a prima facie case that the pill was possibly causing thrombosis. Mm -hmm. And with some difficulty, I um, managed to organize a national study picking out all the deaths of women of childbearing age that would occur in 1966. I had to wait for them to occur. Yep. Yep. Uh, and um, following them up. By that time, I'd recruited a team of uh, field workers. Uh, we called them Derek's Dolls. Uh, and they were personable young, mostly young doctors who would actually visit the general practitioners and get the information at first hand, mm -hmm. which the doctors appreciated. They felt it's... You did this from death certificates or hospital workers? We identified the patients through death certificates, but I also used the same team to follow up the yellow card reports. Yes. And so these girls went out and we collected, I think from memory, about uh, three or four hundred cases. Uh, and come the beginning of 1967, there looked like a, at least a six-fold, maybe an eight-fold excess of pill users. Mm -hmm. it, we took uh, controls, living controls from the same practices. Yep. And so this, uh, this was one uh, first, really, a major first for the, for the committee. When was this published? Uh, that was eventually published in 1968, mm -hmm. uh, but there was quite a lot happened before that, because in, in way back in 65, before we'd even shown that there was a statistical uh, valid case uh, against the pill, I had already spotted a, a difference between mestrolon and, et and ethylene estradiol, uh, and I thought it was possibly a chemical difference, and I didn't do very much about it until quite considerably later. So, uh, uh, anyhow, Late, late in 1966, we, um, Leslie Witts and I went off to the uh, MRC to try and encourage them to set up some parallel studies because one study isn't enough. Yep. And uh, we did that with great difficulty. They were persuaded to do a study, mm -hmm. which they did in hospital admissions, not deaths. Yes. Uh, and we also persuaded the College of General Practitioners to do the same thing, and they mm -hmm. did a 
study, a small one, mainly superficial venous thrombosis in general practice. What was the difficulty? You said you had some difficulty. Well, they didn't really seem to be very interested in the family The MRC planning. wasn't interested? Not at first, no. We no. had to make two visits to them altogether. Yes. Uh, but once I got some d data to show them, they were a little bit more impressed. Mm -hmm. And this basically was uh, Richard Doll and, and Martin Vesey, who I hadn't met at that time. So we, um, we got together and these three studies were supposed to be published early in 1967 yeah. as a medical MRC report. Yeah. Uh, but the college of GPs in the meantime jumped the gun mm -hmm. in order to be in first. They published their little series and uh, so we were forced to, I think, to publish the MRC report prematurely. Yes. This was all happening just before Christmas, I think, remember. No, 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 this is May, May 67. The Christmas business comes two years later. I see. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, to cut a long story short, uh, uh, the MRC paper and our paper, Martin Vesey and I, yep. published on the same day, same edition of BMJ. Mm -hmm. And um, I then, things quiet down a bit after the initial media response, and I then went back to the uh, yellow cards by which time I had about three or four thousand of them. Mm -hmm. And they used to go home in a suitcase every night and were arranged in piles according to first the dose, the chemical, the age of the women, how many children they'd had. And suddenly the penny dropped that where the two hormones were equally distributed in the market. Uh, and I got that data from Intercontinental Medical Statistics. Sure. There was a 52, 48 percent split. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a huge excess, relative excess, of the larger doses, irrespective of what chemical it was. Yeah. And that, um, at that stage, I hadn't looked at the progestogen. And I advised the authorities not to publish anything until we'd had time to do that. But uh, Mr. Crossman wanted something to say in Parliament. And uh, as you know, just before Christmas in 1969, mm. the... Um, so it would say in America it hit the fan and uh, yes. and the committee was heavily criticised. Can you tell us just a bit more about this? Because there was a leak, wasn't there, to Chapman Pincher, I think, of the Daily Express. Uh, yes, I, I had uh, predicted that if we held a conference with the industry, because they are legally obliged to inform their masters in America, yes. uh, that the FDA would have to have the story within 24 hours. Yeah. And I predicted then that there would be a, an automatic leak to the Washington Post through Mr. Morton Mintz, who usually, I think they used it as a sort of safety valve, really, to take the heat out of some yep. of these things. Sure. But I was wrong, because in fact Chapman Pincher had it a day earlier. Mm -hmm. And, and the doctors hadn't been informed. And the doctors hadn't been informed. Now, mm -hmm. the, the committee then were forced to produce a, an urgent yellow pill, which was a piece of A5 uh, paper typed by an ordinary typewriter, yeah. and tried to fob that off as a as one of their adversary, uh, one of the leaflets in their adverse reaction series, and this fooled nobody. They were even more insulted. Yes. After receiving this pathetic little bit of paper. Yeah. Yes. So the, the long, the end of the story really was I got the nickname of uh, Father of the Mini Pill, in respectable circles, and Bill the Pill, <laughs> in the in the eyes of the industry, who weren't too pleased about this. A lot of women came off the pill, didn't they? I mean, there was a lot of. Well, scare it's, in it's alleged that some did. Uh, George Godbro, and I never knew whether he was fooling or not. Uh, the following nine months later, claimed that I'd caused a, a slight uh, eruption in the in the population. Yes. I said, yes. "Well, you know, I'm a man that I can still move around. I'm probably the father of a lot more than I bargained for." So this almost brings us to the end of the committee on the safety of drugs. It actually overlaps the end, yes, because the um, so what, 1970 or something. The the main paper on estrogen doses published in, in 1970. Yeah. Immediately, as uh, soon after Christmas, few hours we could get it out. Mm. By which time I'd, I'd been to Switz, uh, to Sweden, and to Denmark, and got all their data, and it showed exactly the same, yeah. same yeah. thing. Yes. Uh, and th then we get the medicines. And Act. from that, from that, uh, September '71, I think it was, the medicines Act, yeah. became operative, yes. and everything changed. I see. So finally, what do you think the main lessons we learnt from this period? I think I learned three things. First of all, the value of independence. Uh, secondly, the um, need for transparency, the ability to communicate freely with people outside. Uh, and thirdly, the need for more information about the efficacy of drugs. And I, if I take the last one first, I think that was a serious defect in the Act, probably initiated by pressure from the industry. Uh, but many other countries uh, now insist that 
a new drug has to have a margin of superiority uh, or to be very considerably safer. And you, so you've, in other words, you've got to have the complete equation, relative safety and relative efficacy, and, and the Medicines Act prohibits this, really, uh, these considerations. Uh, as far as the independence is concerned, I always felt that it was a great mistake to expect doctors and other, other scientists working in the department to be loyal to a scientifically independent committee on one hand and to the Minister of the Day on the other hand. There may be perfectly good reasons why ministerial decisions clash apparently with the scientific decisions and if they were separate these problems wouldn't arise. I think the, the doctors now find, working at the department now find themselves more as medical advocates uh, rather than uh, being free to, to communicate scientifically. Thank you, Bill, very much. Well, it's my pleasure, Stephen. Thank you very much.